Okay, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, now all speakers are, for the first part of our meeting, are uh, here at the chairman's table. We can, we can start. I would like to uh, welcome you. Thank you very much for coming in these uh, large numbers. Um, it's an honor for me, together with uh, George Lyon and Jan Mulder, to organize this um, ALDE seminar on the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy. Um, the reason for this seminar is that most debates on the Common ag Agricultural Policy concentrate on the, the more political aspects. And uh, these are often very emotional debates um, and with a very predictable outcome most of the time. But um, we um, noticed, especially through uh, a few reports from the European Court of Auditors, that there is also another side of the CAP, and that is the way that um, the money is spent, the way it's organized, um, and that was the, the, the reason for organizing this, um, uh, this seminar. We are spending more than 30 billion euros a year on the common ag agricultural policy. Um, that seems to be uh, sufficient for focusing also on implementation and the management of the way we spend um, these large amounts of money. Um, to speak for myself, I was in the Budget Control Committee a rapporteur on the report on um, the uh, single payment scheme. That is the, the system we use to um, give income support to our European farmers. Um, and I followed closely uh, the other report that we are currently discussing in the Budget Control Committee on the agri-environment schemes. And um, I would like to highlight a few issues of, um, of these reports um, without taking away uh, too much for uh, Mr. Cretin, who will focus much further on this as a member of the European Court. Um, but on the single payment scheme, um, the Court of Auditors found that there were 20 different models in place to calculate income support. Um, and that did gives, this gives so much flexibility to the member states that it's for them rather easy to, among all these different models, to um, sort of sidetrack the general objectives of the common agricultural policy. And the same account for the agri-environmental support where we have more than 100 different objectives, um, and often objectives that are very difficult to, to measure, and where the Court of Auditors found out that 39% um, of all the contracts uh, within these agri-environmental schemes um, were at farms with no specific environmental problems. So there are reasons to criticize the way we are uh, managing and implementing the, the CAP, and that is the main focus of, of this seminar. Um, another element of this, um, in 2010, 1.2 billion euro was uh, refunded to the European Commission. Um, that were financial corrections, um, uh, recoveries. Um, due to the controls by especially the European Commission itself. And the strange thing is that um, you would expect money being paid on wrong, um, for wrong reasons to uh, beneficiaries, that it would be paid back by the beneficiaries themselves. No, 90% of these corrections were by the member states paid out there from their national budgets, which means that um, the taxpayers pay double they pay first for the subsidies and then they pay again um, out of public funds for uh, the recovery. Um, so these kind of issues that came forward from the uh, reports from the, agriculture, from the European Court of Auditors were for us the, um, the reasons for organizing this, this seminar. Um, it's the right timing. We are discussing currently uh, the new period from 2014. Um, we've seen 
the proposals by the European Commission. Uh, they are being discussed among the member states, uh, being discussed in, uh, in Parliament. And um, it's very good to, to use the information that we will receive uh, during this seminar uh, for us as Alde Group, but I also hope for other groups to use that in the further debates and decisions on the future uh, CAP. Um, one of the elements that I find very difficult to grab, that is the balance between sufficient flexibility for member states um, on the one side and sufficient sort of central control to guarantee that we obtain the objectives that we set at European level. And the examples of both um, the single payment scheme, scheme and the agri-environment uh, measures um, do raise some doubts about this. And um, if we now look at the, um, the proposals for the new CAP, and especially the first pillar, where we have the three already famous or infamous uh, greening uh, proposals, um, we all, I think most of us in this room will agree that this system is rather inflexible and that it's a bit strange to say from Brussels, these are the three measures that all farmers have to take uh, at farm level in the whole of Europe. But we, we have a huge dilemma there. Um, I'd love to give member states more flexibility in the implementation of the greening of the common agricultural policy, but practice shows that they seem not to care a lot about these objectives and are more preoccupied by uh, the money that comes from Brussels than by the criteria that are attached to it. So um, for me, it's a very important question also for today, how can we uh, give more flexibility to member states without losing the guarantee of um, uh, obtaining um, the objectives that we do set also um, uh, when it concerns the greening. So for me, that would be one of the uh, crucial questions uh, of today. Um, I'll start by introducing the two speakers of um, the first part of this, uh, this seminar. Um, we are very proud to have uh, Mr. Cretin here. Um, member of the Court of Auditors, um, who has been responsible for uh, several reports in the field of agriculture. Um, he has given a very good presentation in the Budget Control Committee at the end of last year, and I'm very much looking forward to his contribution uh, to today's seminar. And um, we also have Mr. Peter Nowicki from um, the uh, how do I say it in English? Uh, the Agriculture Economics Research Institute from the Netherlands, who will uh, focus on the management of the current management of the CAP, and I hope that he will shine his light on some improvements for the future as well. Um, but let me start by giving uh, Monsieur Cretin the floor. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chairman. First of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me to participate in your group's discussions on the common agricultural policy. The Court of Auditors, of course, welcomes debate with European legislators. Such a debate is in line with the role assigned to the court under the treaties. The treaties specify that the court will assist the Council and uh, Parliament in its uh, endeavours. Now, here we, we are here today to talk about the common agricultural policy. This is a very timely debate. The uh, draft uh, regulation for the CAP 2014 to 2020 was published a few uh, months ago and is up for discussion at Parliament and Council. The Court of Auditors is running through the draft pieces of legislation and will decide in the coming weeks on any comments it wishes to make. You will be notified of those comments in due course for your legislative deliberations. Now, for the purposes of the presentation, I've tried to structure the court's comments in three categories. First of all, the, an effective CAP 
requires clearly defined objectives and uh, measures that are designed to uh, achieve identifiable goals. We will see that that is not always the case. I'll then move on to address the issue of simplifying the CAP. This is something that the European Court of Auditors has already touched upon. Thirdly, I'll look about uh, lightening the inspection burden. That is something that national administrations and professional bodies have often called for. My comments are based on the conclusions drawn up by the uh, Court of Auditors in its recent annual report and indeed in a number of specific reports. Uh, for example, a report on uh, cross-compliance, on the single uh, farm payment scheme, the single payment system that you mentioned, and a report on clearance of accounts. First set of comments on how clear the objectives pursued by the CAP are. And how can we define results-oriented goals? The key objectives of the CAP, as set out in Article 39 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, the main goal is to uh, foster productivity and uh, support uh, income for farmers. Now, those two goals must be mutually compatible. Now, those goals have also evolved to include uh, environmental protection, uh, balanced uh, development uh, in uh, rural areas and animal welfare and so on and so forth. The prevailing legislation is not entirely consistent with those objectives. When we try to assess the measures implemented, it is difficult to map a direct link between the measures implemented and the results expected, because the results expected of the measures were not always specified at the outset. Perhaps I can just illustrate what I have said by running through three key conclusions from some of the court's reports. Some of what I'm about to say I will have already run through at the Budgetary Control Committee. First point. First example or conclusion drawn by the court. Current uh, rules, the SPS rules, the single payment scheme rules, specify that uh, the single payment can be provided to natural or moral person, or legal persons involved in farming activities on land that is eligible and is available to them. So an entitlement to payment, farm activities, eligible land, land available to a farmer. These are terms that have been interpreted by the court in such a way that the SPS beneficiaries, the numbers have increased and the scope of beneficiaries has been broadened beyond uh, active farmers. Just to give you some examples, we have examples, we have new beneficiaries with very little farming activity. These are beneficiaries that receive uh, single payments quite legally because they own land. There are examples that we have flagged up in our report. For example, you have railways, airports, uh, sports clubs, or even uh, towns, cities uh, that own public parkland. All these can be beneficiaries under the SPS. Now, under the new scheme, the entitlement to payments is completely dissociated from the land. There is an entitlement to payment, and that can be traded regardless of the land. You can have land with entitlement to payment, uh, entitlement to payment without land, and then the two mixed together. 
So we have a new type of beneficiary that has emerged. We can have financial investors that are not interested in farming. They are merely trying to benefit from the guaranteed income that they can access through the single payment scheme. In a number of countries, we have pointed out that there are investors that purchased uh, uh, these payment rights uh, with a high unit value. They then triggered those payment rights on marginal land, very low cost land, which requires limited maintenance or indeed no maintenance at all. Let me give you an example, a genuine example. I'm not going to mention the country's name. I don't want to uh, name and shame. I just want to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. In 2008, a beneficiary purchased on the market a payment right without land, paid roughly um, 200 euro. 200,000 euro. He had guaranteed revenue of about a million euro over five years. He just had to activate uh, that payment right. That was possible through to the current programming, end of the current programming period, 2013. So he had a guaranteed income of roughly about a million euro. To activate that payment right, the investment leased at very low cost. 45 uh, hectares of pasture land in a mountainous, mountainous region located uh, quite far from where he lived. Uh, so he wasn't a local farmer. The investment uh, business uh, was very much uh, dissociated from any farming benefit. So he hired uh, or leased uh, low quality pasture land. Of course, there were environmental uh, requirements that had to be uh, fulfilled to receive the aid. So he gave a local uh, livestock farmer the uh, right to, uh, to put his animals out to, to pasture on the land free of charge. So you have 200,000 euro investment uh, uh, income or the return on investment is a million euro over five years. So I think a lot of investors would be quite happy to see that sort of return on investment in other areas other than farming. I've often been asked the following, and I'll tell you that neither member states nor the Commission do not have uh, detailed information on the scale of this type of uh, investment. Most farmers are genuine farmers, but unfortunately the problem that I've just flagged up is not an isolated incident. It is a problem that crops up in a number of countries, although the example that I've just outlined is quite an extreme one to illustrate quite clearly the point that I'm uh, driving at. Second example on the conflict between the goals and the measures. Quite uh, a lot of the European legislation is implemented at national level by national authorities. You mentioned the right of initiative that has to be left with national authorities. The national authorities have quite uh, considerable uh, scope and leeway. However, this national room for manoeuvre has not always been favourable to fostering the goals of increasing farm productivity, for example. For example, the definition of eligible land in a number of member states, marginal land uh, unsuited to farming or uh, uh, wooded or scrub land often used uh, for grazing, such land is deemed eligible land in some member states, but not in other member states. So you see the scope is broadened, but that's not in the interests of European farming to have this broader scope of eligible land under the SPS. Now, of course, to benefit from the SPS scheme, you must ensure that the land is maintained under good agricultural and uh, economic uh, conditions, the GA. 
GAEC conditions. Now, that definition of GAEC is down to the member states. The national requirements, the environmental requirements are specified at national level. Very often, those uh, requirements are very restricted or limited. You may have uh, plots in natural uh, reserves or parks. Uh, there are beneficiaries under the SPS who do not really uh, do very much. The land is not productive. They would not have benefited under the previous scheme, but now they can do so without having to do very much. Indeed, they are banned from undertaking any uh, activity at all. They have to leave the land uh, in its natural condition, leave it as natural as possible, untouched by uh, farmers. Third example, and I think I'll leave it at, uh, at that. I just want to give you a third example of the impact that national measures can have. We have noted that new farmers, generally young farmers, in many countries, must uh, purchase uh, payment entitlements or rights on the market. Some countries have uh, payment rights uh, reserved for uh, young farmers. If that is not the case, young farmers have only one option. They have to purchase these payment rights for the SPS on the market. That does not come free of charge. That is a barrier to uh, market entry. The way in which European legislation is transposed into national legislation can actually undermine the goal of ensuring long-term sustainability and productivity for farming. Perhaps one further obstacle that I could flag up, an internal contradiction within the scheme. The aim of the scheme is to support individual income for farmers, ensure individual income to farmers. However, the aid is dispersed without factoring in the specific uh, circumstances of a given farmer. What type of contradiction does this give rise to? The aid is linked to the land that can be used. We have figures from 2009. 88% of beneficiaries receive 25% of the total value of payments. And at the other end of the scale, 0.5% of beneficiaries received 13% of total payments. The aid dispersed under the SPS does not reflect the cost of ensuring the GAEC conditions are met and the land is properly maintained by farmers. To preserve the quality of the landscape and ensure activity in rural areas. The courts uh, work flag up the aims under the first pillar. The same could be said of the second pillar. We believe that the goals could be better defined. We need to more carefully calculate the aid provided to ensure that uh, the results are obtained and those results are clearly identified at the outset. I'll now move on to my second point and I will try to speed up. Uh, mon deuxième point sur la simplification. Second point on simplification. Simplification of the CAP. This is something that has been discussed for quite some time. The Court of Auditors has tried to identify areas where simplification would be possible, and I'm going to run through three examples. First, something that you touched upon earlier, Chairman, the single payment scheme is implemented through 20 different uh, schemes across the European Union. That is excessive. There are many different uh, schemes in place. You have the uh, historical or traditional system 
In other words, the aid you receive is based on what you, what your business was 10 years ago in 2001, 2010. So it is based on the history of your business in 2001, 2003. Uh, you will receive 300, you receive 300 euro per hectare. That's what you will receive now today. Regardless of the fact that uh, the farming conditions may have changed completely in the meantime. This is extremely complicated and does not uh, foster farm productivity, but it is the scheme in place at the moment. Under the new proposals, there will be radical simplification of the aid scheme. We would welcome such a simplification. Second example. To simplify the scheme, the first step would be to avoid introducing additional complication. The CAP was defined at the outset and then complicated over the course of time. Let me give you an example. For a plot of land to be eligible in the past, there could not be any non-farm activity on that land. But then that rule was changed to allow for non-farm activity on the land, provided that the non-farm activity did not outweigh the farm activity. So you can see how difficult it is to enforce that type of policy. How do you determine when the non-farm business outweighs the farming business? There are uh, problems, for example, how do you ascertain whether uh, uh, tourism business is uh, the predominant part of the overall business, uh, for example, a campsite. One further example on uh, simplification, cross-compliance. I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept. The court believes that uh, considerable simplification is possible and would indeed be necessary. The legal framework that defines cross-compliance uh, encompasses a wide range of measures uh, and is scattered across a plethora of texts, often not linked to farming, and they define uh, operational uh, measures. We have noted that none of the, none of the member states we visited had actually transposed into their national legislation all obligations mentioned in the council regulation and had not uh, provided four checks on all those obligations uh, under their inspection programs. All had uh, provided for checking some of the requirements, but it was also complicated that no member state had uh, allowed for checking all of the 18 statutory management requirements in the four areas where good agricultural and environmental conditions had been defined. I think I've got a few minutes left. My third point, how do we lighten the inspection burden? The court does not believe that increasing the number of inspections is the right way to make the uh, CAP more effective. Now, of course, this is an area where we must tread carefully. It's a bit like uh, with tax. In France, there are are those that uh, say that uh, a good tax is an, a long-standing tax. In other words, one that has been around for a long period of time. That is the case for the CAP. Once farmers get used to a system, it's very difficult to uh, alter and reform the system. A good system is a long-standing system. That is often the opinion of those responsible for implementing the CAP. In other words, the national paying agencies. We are often told that the best form of simplification would be not to tinker around with the CAP too much. The court's position on this could be summarized as follows. Fewer checks, but more effective checks with clear legislation, uh, pertinent legislation that can be verified easily. The clearer 
and more verifiable the legislation is, the more easy it is to run the checks that are required to ensure that uh, there is full compliance with legislation. We believe that there are several areas where action can be taken. Firstly, a better definition of the responsibilities between the different uh, inspection levels. We need a better uh, inspection chain. At each inspection level, we need community standards in place and we need a system in place whereby the higher levels in the inspection chain can rely on and draw on the work done by the lower links in the chain. The Commission, for example, should re-examine the way it supervise the national, supervises the national paying agencies. Currently, the national paying agencies are required to uh, carry out on-site checks on-site checks are the only really effective checks, but the national paying agencies have to uh, run on-site checks for 5% of uh, aid requests. Is that genuinely effective? Is that 5% figure useful to uh, draw useful lessons? We're not entirely convinced. Second point, we believe that the Commission should review the role of national certification bodies. Should national certification bodies not play a greater role when it comes to checking the legality and the regularity of operations? That is something that is not currently in their remit. The Commission should also consider the conformity decisions taken under the account clearance process. They are not terribly effective, as you reminded us earlier. They are not terribly effective uh, in terms of their impact on the end uh, beneficiary, because very often the reimbursements come from the national budget. The member states are not really encouraged to be vigilant when it comes to inspections, because the Commission has decided uh, not to consider compliance with cross-compliance as a criteria determining eligibility for direct aid. So there are legal requirements that are enshrined in a regulation, but compliance with those legal requirements is not a criteria that determines eligibility for the single uh, payment scheme. So you can fail to comply with these requirements and still continue to receive aid under the SPS. So that's not really going to encourage the member states to uh, do their utmost to enforce uh, compliance with those measures. So we're in a somewhat strange situation. We have legal requirements defined for cross-compliance, but unlike all other legal requirements, uh, compliance here is not a prerequisite to receive or to continue to receive aid. I don't believe that this situation will change under the current proposal. To conclude, the court believes that uh, we need to ensure that cross-compliance is more effective and to this end we need operational requirements that can be checked and that are uh, checked on the farms and that is not currently the case. I'm now going to skip ahead to my conclusion because I can see that I have already overrun my time slot. I'll conclude by saying the following. In a imprecise or incomprehensible legislation is a problem, and I'm not sure that the current proposal does not meet that definition. If we have incomprehensible legislation or excessively detailed legislation, then that will undermine the effectiveness of the CAP and will not lead to simplification. I believe that it is important that the uh, CAP legal framework should define the specific uh, goals pursued under the various measures and the results expected. The measures then defined must uh, be flanked with proactive inspections carried out by the Commission and Member State. No legislation can uh, stipulate at the outset 
all circumstances under which the measures are to be applied. So the Commission must be in a position to ensure proactive management and implementation of the legislation because we cannot uh, foresee all scenarios out the outset. So I'll leave it at that, Chairman, and I do apologise for going on at length. Well, thank you very much, Monsieur Cretin. Um, I, I gave you a few extra minutes because um, I thought your message was, was very interesting. Um, less is more. That was uh, uh, one of the main messages that, that you gave us. Um, let me quickly move to our next speaker, Mr. Um, uh, Nowicki from um, Hedley, at Landbouw Economisch Institute. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. The issue which is bringing us together today is, um, is a policy which is rather venerable now. It's been around uh, for 50 years. Uh, we're celebrating the half a century of CAP. And I think that it, if I were to somehow, from an academ academic perspective, try to represent the common man, uh, what would be the questions that I would want to ask the Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development? Sorry, I went up too fast. Can you go back step? Because I'm really on my title, which is um, will rather than does, will the proposed cap improve competitiveness and sustainability? And those are the two questions I think that the man on the street would like to ask. And why? Because I think that he needs to better understand what is competitiveness all about. And I can just ask, give you some questions that he might ask. Uh, for instance, if a farmer were responding to market demand, would, would they really need support for their income? In, and the other way of looking at that is, is the revenue provided by the market enough to support the current number of farmers in the EU? So these are the types of questions that he might ask. Um, he might also ask what level of income would, should be adequate and how much of this should be supported. He might also ask what is a fair basis on which cap payments should be distributed and should somehow the poorest receive more and how to determine more so as to provide them with the means to become more competitive. So it's already a, a number of questions which are changing the guidelines a little bit the goalposts of what we are normally used to talking about. Um, the common man on the street might also ask in terms of sustainability. Well, now that the water, the, um, the water reserves are already, superficial waters are already polluted, how will the new farming change the situation? Because we have a problem with drinking water at this time. Um, what about the biodiversity? How can it come back, all that has been lost? And will the new cap restore this? And these questions, in fact, as we shall see, um, are not really new questions. They are old questions. And well, you can see that I've tried to tackle a number of issues very succinctly because I can't really answer these questions to the common man. But I think this is where the policy should try to be going. Um, so we'll go over to the next slide, which will give us more of a historical perspective. These questions have been asked over time. I mean, in the very beginning, it was obvious that the farmer was in a difficult situation, as was the citizen, because there was not enough food. It was simple. And that was the main objective. And the ambition of the European Union to provide all its citizens with enough food and to make farmers more productive worked very well. So that rather rapidly, there was in fact a question of, well, how do we manage surpluses? And in the supply, and in the period of trying to cope with this new productivity, and because of the revenues which were provided to farmers and the, mark and the as you'll see later, the price support that was given to them for their products. Um, then by the time we get to Mekshari in the 1992 reforms, there were certain issues that became really important. Environment, the first notions of sustainability were coming in, as well as, well, how do you fairly stabilize the in incomes? And then you can see how the policy has been moving progressively um, into, com into the issues of competitiveness. Uh, and Agenda 2000 really put a, put, its, uh, put a focus on this issue. Um, how do we ensure that farmers are, as we become in 2003, uh, really market-oriented and still providing care for the environment? How do we improve all the damage, which I 
said that the common man on the street uh, has in his mind. And, uh, and finally, with the CAP health check, we are really repeating the old foci that I talked about of market orientation, competitiveness, environment, as well as adding new challenges. And uh, so, well, let us then go to the next slide. Um, yes, we, there was uh, early on, a, in 92 already, a switch from price support towards direct income support. And I think that it's important to see that, in fact, um, this was working very well. There, there was uh, the beginning of reduction of price distortions and improved market, ori market orientation. The money arriving to farmers was, becoming, was doing so in a more efficient way. Um, uh, incomes at that point, that's before we had the great uh, volatility that we experienced in the last few years, had become stable. Um, and cross-compliance, um, um, well, it was there. It was a way that the cap payments were a way of, of providing leverage to, to bring the environment in, in as a main point of, of uh, focus for the farmers, at least a main point of focus. But the post mcshari cap inherits, inherited properties from the old model, strong support to large and intensive form, for farms. And, it, and so the man on the street still has his basic questions about what we mean by competitiveness and, uh, and support to farming, what we mean about sustainability and uh, the damage that the farming has been doing to the environment. But the, next slide, please. But the policy moves on. I think that um, there were certain issues politically to be handled. Is there a need? Yes, we saw that in the very beginning. Uh, there was a need to improve productivity. There was the need to improve uh, farm incomes. Um, but it can always be partly, because very quickly um, we saw that there were the, um, the, the milk lakes and the butter mountains and all the rest of it. Um, but this farm income support, the direct support for farm needs was made to, to address that issue. But how well targeted were these direct payments? But in fact, that's where we begin to understand some of the remarks made by Mr. Cretin, that um, they were not really, really well supported with regard to income support, because they were not support focused on needs, and they were not focused on who, you know, what we mean by the eligible farmer. Um, and the indirect impact of the direct payments, um, because they don't have to be linked to, to particular economic act, uh, farming activities, is that uh, in any case, they were stimulating farms to exploit scale of economies of scale. So intensive farmers were becoming more intensive. Um, the degree of high uh, income support is high. And if you look even back at figures produced uh, in the 2007-2009 period, you can see that um, basically that the, in, that the amount of money being received by direct payments and other forms of agricultural support was a very strong part of the actual costs of farming, uh, labor excluded. You can see even in Finland that the, that the, that the costs were greater than, the, uh, sorry, the support received from Brussels was actually even greater than the actual costs of farming labor excluded. Um, but, okay, um, the system is the way it is. Um, then, if we move to the, to the future, my next slide, what happens? Well, what happens is that for the EU15, obviously the, 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 the point of distribution of, of revenues to farmers, distribution of the, of the cap budget is taking effect and this will impact some countries more than others. I highlighted two, not because they are worse or better than anyone else, but, but it just shows that, in fact, we, we need to ask the Commission um, to really to explain why it is that, uh, that Italy will be losing such a large amount of money when they have lots of small farmers. Um, of course, the Netherlands uh, is losing proportionally even more, but that's more or less in line with the with the, the number of farmers which are in the Netherlands. So, in fact, the Netherlands comes out okay. In a country like Italy, you might ask questions, but I can't provide the answers to this. And these are just questions which which are there and have to be to be to be answered. And then, if we go on to my next slide. We, saw, we find another situation where um, many of the EU 12 countries 
are going to find that their, that their, posi their position is going to be improving uh, uh, when they, in, in 2014, and, and this is normal, I mean, we've all recognized as being normal. Um, some countries, like Latvia, will receive a sizable increase. Um, is it in line with its farming activity? It's a good question. Um, Romania, and I could have used Bulgaria as an example as well, a very substantial um, amount of change in absolute terms. So when we are looking at the types of problems of you know, who will be benefiting from these in this increased budget, um, then this is where uh, the question of equity will be coming in, the question of, of um, um, yes, which farmer is receiving the money for which type of activity. But on the other hand, let's look at it positively. I mean, these, these are warning signs. Let's go to my next, my next um, one, the reallocation and targeting of DPs. Obviously, um, the basic premium is, is, is no longer um, the, the major, major, major part of the budget. I mean, still it is, but it's less important. Green payments have become, have become really uh, quite an important focus. But one might ask oneself about the relative amount given for young farmers or small farmers, or f farmers with natural handicaps. Um, how, to, how, to, how to put this? This is not um, a criticism, but it's just a question of, of what is the common man, uh, man on the street going to be asking the, the, the commissioner? Uh, are we targeting the right farmers? Are we, getting, are we targeting the uh, you know, competitiveness correctly? Are we targeting um, uh, the sustainability correctly? And this is what we expect the commission to and the parliament to debate in the future. Uh, this is my second slide on this. Yes. Um, the fact that there's a basic income payment that, that maintained for all farmers is, is okay. I mean, we understand the philosophy, um, but again, as I said before, the payments need to be re related to the needs. And we are not sure yet ab about the magnitude of the basic payment and its significance for the individual farmer and how those be distributed. And the second point is the share of the payments going to supportive environmental public goods will increase. That's important. But they're not directly linked to incurred costs. And the greening that we talk about greening involves much more than just land management. And no farm is maybe getting sufficient um, um, payments for, uh, main, for the greenhouse gas emission control or for other types of pollution um, abatement, especially in water pollution. And you know, where are the specific programs that, that we can actually monitor in the future? And so therefore we might feel that the, that the greening activities are perhaps n not ambitious and they are lacking um, performance standards or in French the, the résultat d'obligation. My third point about reallocation and targeting is that, again, what about the most important issue confronting uh, agri uh, agriculture today? Because it has not been well addressed in the past. How are we going to really to move towards a low carbon economy? And um, well, I won't go to the second point because I don't have time. But um, I think that there's a lot of onus placed on the member states as well and not just the, the European Commission, that how to use the money which is being given to them to, to have a long-term vision for what we mean by competitive and sustainable agriculture, because the long-term vision is more than just the, the, the types of greening measures which the Commission may have been work proposing so far. Then to go on to my next slide. We have seen from work which we have done before, um, in fact, my institute um, was involved um, with a foresight study called CENAR 2020, which was the analysis of the prospects for agriculture in the EU, and it's on the DG Agri website under the evaluation study part. And we've, we've already noticed that a regional analysis, and I'll give you one example later on so you can actually see a map, a bit of color, that the regional shifts in agricultural practice have a corresponding effect on in regional income. The agriculture is changing radically. The signals we give it means that there are going to be changes in what types of agriculture are practiced in what types, which parts of the EU. And this will have very significant uh, impacts in, in, regional, in, in, in farm income at the regional level. The number of farms continues to decrease. 
and, uh, and especially in function of income. Uh, but there is a restructuring process going on, and I'll show you a slide which will help you understand that. But what is most important, and this comes back to the point that perhaps, th you know, how do you, we deal with the excess capacity in farming, perhaps, maybe that's a real issue that we have to address, that the decrease in employment, in, uh, the decrease in employment is more severe for farming than for the other sectors, of all other sectors um, combined. And so then let's go to my, some insights. I think that, um, you know, no matter what policy scenario you, you think about, in which we've worked on a number of ourselves and others have as well, that when these, the cap scenarios will not really affect uh, productivity or production levels. Um, cap, the, the EU is a productive country. Um, the only thing which we will see that some policy alternatives will have more of impact on livestock in particular, livestock production. That the rural areas and this is uh, the S-Bond studies will also can, can, uh, confirm this, that rural areas are increasingly dependent upon other sectors outside of agriculture, and, and therefore agriculture is fitting into another type of economic context. And that the justification for the new cap has to be in terms for really precise objectives for competitiveness, and we don't know if we've really seen that or not, the common man on the street might not be able to answer the questions I asked at the beginning, and for guaranteed environmental outcomes. And now for a map. In, in our study, we were looking at several different types of scenarios, and they are not exactly the ones which you will find in the new CAP proposals, but they are similar enough to the reference scenario. And you could think that, in fact, um, the one to the right, the reference scenario, uh, left, sorry for you, um, the reference scenario is, is actually not so bad, because you would find that there is a, 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 um, a, a change in farm income which is rather positive on the whole, um, to the east and not too negative to the west. But what that hides, and I can't show you too many maps, is that to the east, that restructuring means that there is a massive loss of farm employment, more than 50%. And even to the west, there would be a significant decrease of employment over that period on the order of at least 20%. Not everywhere, but in most parts of, of, of Europe. I will go into that more importantly, but just to make you to realize that these issues of competitiveness and sustainability are interlinked and very important. And then I go on to my, just a few very quick slides, that if we want to look at sustainability, because it's hard to put a, a, a definition on it, what do we mean? Well, that there are certain parts of Europe which are more potentially affected by soil erosion. Next slide. Other areas which have to work with the scarcity of water. Next slide. Other areas where there are particular soil conditions which are susceptible to nitrate leaching and the problems of water pollution, drinking water pollution, for example. And last slide in that series, and also the biodiversity risk. The, 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 bio, the, the sustainability issues are not the same throughout Europe. They, they vary enormously. So now coming a bit to my closing. Next slide. There are th three slides left. There are three points for competitiveness. That the, the cap and trade policies right now and the way they design the future will always have more of an effect on agricultural income and the number of farms than on agricultural production overall. And then the second point is that the land prices, and the uh, Court of Auditors report noted this as well, um, a, is a, a play, plays a key role in buffering the, the effects of, of the negative effects of cap. And because, in fact, often it plays on the rental value of the land. And that's one way in which farmers can actually survive. When, when, um, and then the last point is that the abolishing income support will have altogether, and there are people who think about it, would have a very negative impact overall on farm income and on the number of farms throughout the EU27. So we cannot really propose, and I, I, if I dare use this phrase, scrap the cap. No, you cannot propose that. It is not feasible. It is not realistic. The questions I'm asking are not questions to put down the new cap. The questions I'm asking are to make sure that we answer these questions. Next slide, for sustainability. Um, it, we really have to understand that the transformation of, the, of land use and of agricultural practice can be identified today as a result of the policies we are making today. So you have to accompany them. You have to make sure 
that there will be areas of specialization and they need particular sets of policies and areas which will be based on basically livestock and, and mixed cropping and they need um, a, a specific set of policies. So you cannot avoid sustain, uh, targeting issues when come, talking about sustainability. Um, and then agricultural and environmental policies together, because it's also DG environment, it can enhance the environmental contrib contributions of both of these farming systems. So we'd just be positive about it. Finally, that specific environmental problems can benefit from farm practice guidelines and incentives and measures for targeted areas. Incentives, yes, but measures to constrain as well. You can't just have incentives. Okay, last slide, including your marks. Um, well, we're on the way, but we need to target the cap. And I know it's a bad word, people don't like this phrase, but we need to target, um, and the income support is not targeted to the people with have perhaps the greatest needs. And this is a political issue, and I don't know how to get around it. But I'm speaking, I hope, in an environment which can, can handle that type of question. The man on the street is talking to you. I also pay taxes, by the way. <laughs> um, the link, the, the, between, the, the link between the desired actions of greening and fi financial compensation is just is either weak or it's not there. You can't see it. And the increase in flexibility of the second pillar is welcome and should be used to encourage innovation, 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 innovation. And uh, also other parts of the second pillar towards um, investment in human and social capital is extremely important. It's just not the environmental stuff. And the environmental reflection on reforming the competitive and sustainable issue that the, you have to admit that the per hectare payments are not related to real income needs. I'm sorry, I'm, I have the academic liberty, I can say that. And then, and for me, the, the, the last issue, which we feel, especially from the Netherlands' point of view, but I'm also French, believe it or not, um, so it's a problem everywhere, water scarcity and climate change in, impacts require a stronger orientation of agriculture at a regional level. So we think that, that, the, that these issues of competitiveness and sustainability are both for the EU as a whole and the government position where you are now, but also for the member states. And we think that both parties have to work harder on delivering the cap which people are waiting for. This is the man on the street speaking to you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Nowicki. When you started with your opening question, will the proposed CAP, new CAP, improve competitiveness and sustainability? I thought it was a very promising question to start with, but you uh, more than fulfilled that promise. Um, my objective is to get a much more dynamic, innovative, and sustainable agricultural uh, sector. And um, if I listen to you, the new proposals are not automatically going into that direction. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions. We have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, I'll start with uh, members of parliament present, um, and then the rest of the, the audience uh, has opportunities as well. George, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is to, to, to Michel Cretan. Uh, the problems you highlighted around active farmers, uh, eligible acres, uh, and the, the inspection systems that, and how you think you could probably reduce the number of inspections, are they being addressed in the proposals put forward, these issues? And, and do you think the proposals as they stand actually are a proper response to the, the issues that you have highlighted? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, they are addressed. Now, uh, are they properly addressed? <laughs> that is the real question. No, I think that the, uh, yeah, the, the, the proposals are, are put forward with the um, uh, clear preoccupation in the mind of the Commission that, there is, that we have a problem there. Okay, uh, and so that the, 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 the question of the active farmers, the uh, burden of controls, etc., all this must be addressed. Uh, I, I don't want to, to preempt, you know, what, what the court will, add, add, we will say in the end about that, because I have my own views and uh, there is a discussion process currently going on within the court, uh, but, uh, we, it seems to us that the uh, the the, uh, uh, the way the commission is the the way this issue is addressed in in the um, in the new proposal is 
still rather uh, bureaucratic and maybe uh, may prove difficult to, to put into practice. Uh, as for the uh, for the issue of controls, uh, well, I think no. We we are still rather far from a, a, a an integrated level of an integrated structure of controls where each level uh, would provide something to the uh, to the level above, and and the level above could rely on what has been done uh, at the level below. And, and so on. I mean, the, the, so there is still a lot of, of uh, competitive or, or uh, not, not necessarily competitive, but parallel controls which do not necessarily converge uh, into a, 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 an overall structure, a, an integrated structure. The, 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 the question I have mentioned, there is a long-standing discussion between the court and the commission about the, uh, the reliability of the control statistics provided by the member states. We still believe that these the control statistics provided by the agencies and theoretically, quote-unquote, uh, 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 verified or validated by the uh, uh, national uh, by national certification bodies uh, are still not of a very good quality. Uh, so, 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 and 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 so, therefore, we we still rely more on our controls. <laughs> Uh, and, and there is a continuing divergence between the conclusion that you can draw from the control statistics provided by the member states and the, uh, the, 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 the sample of transaction which is audited by the court. I mean, they, they, they are producing different results. And so there is, it seems to us that there is still a lot of progress. We would, we would very much welcome having, uh, for the court, for example, being able to rely on the control which have been carried out at the national level. But in order to do that, we must be sure that the controls carried out at the national level have been carried out properly. In other words, that they respond to our criteria of uh, effective controls. Uh, I don't want to say that there are no progress in, the, in this direction, but we are not there yet by, by, some, by a, a good measure. Of, uh, by good measure. Yeah. Thank you. That, that is a rather disturbing message because um, the, the national co control authorities should be the fundament of, um, of the European system. So that, that is rather disturbing. I, I must say I am even more looking forward to the court's evaluation of the current proposals, but thank you for shining already a little <laughs> light on this. Um, I hope the member states are listening carefully as well because I'm afraid they're more focusing on uh, the sheet that Mr. Nobiki presented about how much more or less they will get under the new system than uh, on the way they get it. Um, Jan Mulder, please. Thank you. Two very brief questions. First of all, to Mr. Cretin about simplification. As long as I have been in the parliament, it's already a number of years we have been talking about it. So if we would find a solution this afternoon, it would be very good. Sometimes one of the suggestions that is made, that if a farmer wants to receive money, that is cross-compliance, he has to adhere to strict environmental standards. The same farmer, when he wants to deliver a product to a factory, he has to adhere to strict environmental standards as well. That's what the market is requiring. Both are controlling. Do you see a possibility of more cooperation between the private industry and the government that one respects the norms of the other so that you do not have double work? That's the question. And then a question to Mr. Nowicki. He has said the payments are not at all linked to uh, incurrent cost and the greening activities lack performance standards. Are you optimistic that we can develop objective uh, parameters for the greening activities, for the services that farmers are giving to landscape, and I don't know what. In my view, that should differ from region to region. But are you optimistic that you can hand the Commission some objective criteria? 
Greta. Okay, I'll, I'll try to, even though we didn't, we didn't actually perform any work which was specifically directed to answering that question, but I'll try to answer Mr. Mulder's question. Um, no, I, I don't think that uh, they, I mean, they could complement each other, but I, I don't think that they could substitute for one another. Uh, basically, the, the controls which are carried out uh, for the application of the legislation, they are basically uh, environmental controls. Today, one must realize that the real justification in, in the current regulation, the real justification for paying farmers anything is the fact that they are maintaining the land in good agricultural and economic conditions. They, 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 there are no other conditions than this one. Okay, so, uh, and, and I don't think that a, a, an, an industrialist who is buying the crop of the farmer is interested in whether or not this, um, the, the product that he buys has been produced by respecting uh, landscape characteristics, uh, usage of uh, water, economy of uh, water usage, uh, not, uh, not uh, g uh, dispersing too much, uh, too, many too much nitrate on, on, on the land. Uh, they are not interested in that. I mean, they are interested in the quality of the product they buy, either to make butter or uh, processed foods or whatever. Okay, so I think that we are in two different uh, categories. That they that they are they are not two dif two different categories of control. That they are no no substitute one for one another, uh, and uh, so the the the, the real uh, uh, impact of. Uh, the, the real importance of uh, public controls, of, of controls related to the legislation, are control on the, on the respect of the environment. And I think that they are necessary by themselves. I mean, they, they are justified by themselves. But as uh, Mr. Novicki showed, I mean, some of his maps showed that, uh, you know, it is clear that the main problems are very different in across Europe, that you have uh, areas where, such as in Spain, where the problem is water, but you have other countries where the problem is not at all water. It may be, I don't know, uh, too much nitrate or uh, uh, biodiversity or whatever. So, so I think that there is a real need for specific the, the the various the the main chapters of an and of. A, an, uh, an environmental policy are really uh, are rather easy to delineate, but then you should be ready. It seems to me that you should be ready to to uh, not not to want to apply them across the board, but to to specify for which which are the main problems in which areas and what how this problem should be added. In other words, there is a need for regionalizing. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, the environmental policy, which today is, is still not the, not the, main, uh, the main characteristic of this uh, cross-compliance policy, which it is too much global and, and across the board. Thank you. Mr. Nowicki. Thank you for the challenge to define objective criteria, which obviously I'm not going to do on the, on, on the spot, but am I optimistic about it? Um, I would change it slightly. I say what is necessary, and that's why I used it in, on my slide, are what we call performance standards. Um, you know, is that uh, can you have more of something over time? Because the problem of the objective criteria is say that on June 1st, you have to have this or that or that done. Well, the seasons are different. The, the, the things, everything is different. So you cannot usually do it by very con actually fixed criteria as we have on a certain day, something should happen. But it's more that over time that you can see, you can see it, um, a movement occurring, and that is certainly possible. Um, I'm inspired very much by my experience um, through organizations like FWAG in the UK or by some of the different um, uh, park uh, regionaux in France, it's the regional park system, where they had agents going out and working with farmers doing individual farm plans. And these individual farm plans are not meant for one year, they're meant for five years, they're meant for 10 years. 
and it, it and there they can actually have objectives which you can then see that they can be attained in time it can be object objectives in terms of number of species um, of, of certain type of, of herb herbs um, or in terms of, of um, con improving conditions you can never say the bird will come but condition improving the conditions for an, a, a certain range of wildfowl and, and for birds so wildlife and birds. Um, so yes, I think it is possible. It does require two things. It does require some sort of contractualization. And it does not fixing of the, well, and it requires the fixing of objectives that can be realized over time. Thank you. And as Rapporteur on Biodiversity in this House, I really like your focus on, on, uh, on biodiversity. Um, we, we have a, a few more minutes left. I would like to allow um, a few questions, um, if there are questions. Um, two or three questions, and then I um, give the answers. Yes, please. Vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Noch mal eine kurze Frage. Thank you. Chairman, just a brief question that I've been dealing with. We, of course, want a competitive, environmentally friendly type of agriculture, but we also want to secure farmers' incomes. We talk about active farmers a great deal. Well, I would say I can only think of lazy and hardworking farmers. I don't know of any active farmers. And we could talk about large farms and small farms. Is it not contradictory to be talking in these terms today? Trying to merge social policies with economic policies in this way. Perhaps we could resolve this conflict. Perhaps we should pursue economic competitiveness policy on the one hand and social policy on the other hand and keep the two areas uh, separated and Otherwise, they will constantly be creating friction. This inherent conflict of wanting agriculture to be competitive, that is the problem. That is to say that we want to be competitive. But what happens when farmers are competitive? And for me, that includes farmers earning a decent income. And then you start to bring in other criteria, like the size of the holding and various other complications. I think it's overcomplicating things, trying to merge all these aspects. Well, perhaps we should have a division there so that we can deal with each aspect adequately. Well, that's a very challenging thought. Um, someone over there, yes? Merci beaucoup. Faustine de Fossé, du Bureau européen de l'environnement. Hello. Mr. Critter, my question to you. At the end of your presentation, you said that imprecise, incomprehensible legislation will bring about additional administrative burden, burden in terms of checks. Now, on greening, with the current debate on the package of measures, rather simple measures, of compulsory greening for all farmers versus uh, optional measures. There are three practices, fairly simple practices that have been promoted. And we're not talking about the content itself. I don't think this is the right place, just the structure of the policy. So I think that's fairly uh, simple to understand and to check. Now, in the parliament, however, there's a lot of criti critique against this. You want a precise checklist of measures that farmers could choose from with defined criteria. We don't know those criteria, perhaps objective, perhaps not. It's not yet def clear. So wouldn't all of this bring about additional administrative burden, uh, require additional checks and supervision, especially when talking about uh, aid under Pillar 1. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. <laughs> uh, Roman Izdebski, I worked for the uh, Agricultural Committee for five years. Uh, I have a question to Mr. Nowicki. My pronunciation is better, might be not Nowicki. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would like uh, to touch the issue of uh, very sensitive uh, issue, of course, uh, direct payments uh, di uh, distribution. You have mentioned in, your in one of your slides that it is uh, not re uh, related to income support, but it is the basic function of these direct payments. But uh, my question is, 
why you don't deliver the tables uh, with the income of the farmers from, example, FADN uh, database? Because uh, you stated that it's not related uh, uh, to the income, but we have no any, any, uh, any proofs. I know that the, the income is very difficult to evaluate from different reasons. It's my question. Have you had difficulties with such data? And it's a reason that you didn't deliver the present income per member states, per farm, and so on. Uh, the second question is, uh, you question also the uh, as criteria uh, for direct payment uh, distribution uh, per hectare. What is your suggestion? Which criteria will be better? Because uh, we discuss about the, the quantity of utilized agricultural area, we discuss about the employment in the agriculture. Uh, which criteria, one or several, would be better than, uh, than per hectare? Mr. Novici, could you uh, try to answer the first and third question, and then Mr. Cretin, the second one? No, no, no. I mean, the first speaker and the, and the last speaker. We, we now had three different questions. That was on, on distinction between economic policy and social policy. I mean, I, I don't know how the EU itself would, could do a social policy for rural areas. I don't know in, under what mandate it would put it. On the other hand, it has a responsibility for rural areas as such, for rurality, for the, and it looks, I think, uh, to the, uh, f the revenue of farmers as the only leverage, I mean, I'll be controlled by, by Pierre, of course, Pierre Bascu, but the only leverage that it has on, on social policy in rural areas. Now, I might be wrong, but I think that's, the, that's the, my understanding of it at this point. And um, um, I'm not sure what I can say m more about that, um, quite frankly. That's, that's for me just a question that the instruments are not there. Um, the, the, what is certainly is that um, uh, income um, is so sensitive to um, commodity markets at this point um, that the policies will help farmers um, survive volatility in, in, um, in, uh, in markets, that's, that's for sure. Um, but this is related to uh, income and not to total production. Total production is something where the EU is productive, but we're talking about a large number of farmers. Um, right now there are um, 11 million farms in the EU, uh, so that's a number, quite a number of farmers plus farm workers and all the rest, so it's an, it's an enormous um, um, part of the labor pool. Um, and, uh, and many of these farmers are earning very little. And there is no other tool that I know of that could bring them uh, support. Now, that may mean that you have to say that this issue is, uh, by subsidiarity, only a member state issue, and therefore that we become very draconian. And if we were to have a full liberalization, I don't know if we can go backwards a few slides to my one map with all the different countries on it. Oh, you go there, it's fine. Yeah, okay, this one here. In the, if I look at a full liberalization, you can see that the impact on farm income would be enormous, and um, only very few areas might benefit in this uh, situation. And that's what you're proposing: is that you know, okay, let's just take care of of the agricultural side. Let's be competitive, and in that case, you don't really need income support, and that's the result that you have a mass, a very large number of farmers leaving. I have some figures here, just to, if I can go back um, to this document. I hope it's the right one. Well, I won't bother you, but it just, uh, I don't, didn't show up on my screen. But it, it's just enormous amount of farmers that would be cut out in, um, in a full liberalization scenario. So this is why it's so delicate. The tools for social policy don't exist, as far as I know, at the EU level, 
and other. So now in terms of the third question, I, I don't have an answer for the first part of it that you asked. Um, and in terms of which criteria, why the hectare payment? I'm, obviously, you have to find a, a, something which corresponds to the, the, um, the real need of the farmer. Um, and I don't know that, um, that even in terms of, of income needs, whether someone who is farming th three hectares of wheat uh, has the same uh, problem of somebody who's farming 300 hectares of wheat. And I don't see how, in that case, a per hectare payment is going to provide the answer. What is better? Um, I think that maybe there has to be a f an understanding, and this comes back to the first point, uh, what is the policy about? Is it about competitiveness only, and therefore um, you are going to say, okay, a certain amount of farms might need support, but they should be very few, uh, because if they're being competitive, they don't need support on the world markets. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, in the other cases, you simply have an easing out policy, and that's simply s understood politically, but you don't renew the farms uh, to aid to those farms. You simply just take them out of production altogether or make sure they go into larger farm units. That's very drac draconian. In, in theory, if you, um, per hectare of payments, you say, okay, it's understandable, it's clear, but it's not a solution, and I don't have a better one. Yet, but I think that's what the, that's where, you, where there has to be some deep thinking going on. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Novici. Um, for social policy, I think we should also take the off farm income uh, into account because that's often neglected at the moment, just focusing on the farms itself. Other people who uh, work in the same house are having an income as well. Mr. Keita, very briefly, uh, please, uh, the first question, because then we can have a, a very short coffee and tea break. Thank you. Yes, well, I'll try to be very brief. Now, to respond to your question, I think that when you're talking about environmental issues, you're talking about regional issues. There isn't really a national threat to the French environment or the German environment, the regional phenomena. So it's at that regional level that we need to define the principal risks, identify the right policies to deal with those risk factors. But I don't think there is such a thing as a shopping list that you can pick and choose from as an individual farmer. Because you were asking about how the policy should be implemented and the burden in terms of implementation. The longer the lists, the greater the detail, then uh, the burden increases in accordance with that. We traveled to the Netherlands, and there the inspectors in charge of environmental checks had lists with 172 individual items to check. Now, that's very long. It's very burdensome, difficult, unwieldy. So the more detail you work in, the more you spread out and scatter the various measures, the harder it becomes to keep track of things. So really, we need to identify the key regional threats and risks, identify the right policies to tackle those problems, and really take a targeted approach when it comes to the control so that they can be rigorous. Thank you, Mr. Kukai. Sir uh, Novici, that's the right pronunciation, I hope. Novitsky. Novitsky, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your con contribution um, for this first part of the seminar. I would like to invite everybody to have either a coffee or tea. I think it's uh, served outside. And to be, be back in around 10 minutes to start with the second session. Thank you.
I ask everyone to take a seat so we can begin the second half. Okay, could I uh, begin uh, by opening the second uh, part of our session uh, today? Uh, we're running some 15 minutes late, late but uh, I think we'll, we'll maybe manage to catch up as we go through, uh, certainly when it comes to the drinks afterwards. Uh, could I just remind my speakers that it's 20 minutes uh, per person to, to make sure that uh, we do have time for questions and that uh, I'll be passing along a note to them five minutes out from, from the end. So, uh, To continue just the, the theme of the... Uh, the quality and delivery and uh, efficiency of agricultural expenditure. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Michael Cooper. Michael is the director of the UK coordinating body which works with United Kingdom paying agencies to ensure effective administration of CAP funds in the UK. He also attends EU-wide meetings of the paying agencies, uh, the so-called conference of directors of EU paying agencies. Uh, he's going to look uh, in his presentation at the risks to successful delivery by the EU paying agencies of the new uh, CAP proposals, uh, having, specific, uh, having regard to specific proposals for future direct payments, such as greening, capping, salary mitigation and the active farming test, uh, all issues that are of great pertinence to the debate we've been having up until now. Uh, he will try to point out uh, the specific challenges that paying agencies and claimants are going to face in relation to the administration of the CAP. So we're going to hear uh, from uh, Michael, who's go whose organisations are responsible for delivering the new proposal. So Michael, without any further ado, could I hand over to you to, to begin your presentation? Well, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to provide a paying agency view. Uh, hopefully that will add uh, another perspective to the debate. Of course, uh, the paying agencies have uh, many different demands on them, rightly so. Uh, farmers want their payments as quickly as possible and with the minimum administrative burden. Uh, national administrations want paying agencies to deliver the schemes as efficiently as possible. And of course, the, the EU institutions uh, expect payments to be made uh, within the scheme rules, uh, legally, and uh, with, with due regard to the uh, regularity requirements. Uh, within the UK, there are four paying agencies. Within the EU as a whole, there's over 80 paying agencies. Um, those uh, organisations uh, get together on a fairly regular basis. So although these are my personal observations, uh, I think probably they, they reflect quite a, a widespread opinion uh, amongst the member states. Um, I'm not going to uh, get involved in, in some terms of some of the, the sort of policy questions, uh, but what I will suggest is that um, implementation issues do need to be considered uh, during the formulation of the regulations. Um, the, the whole question of whether and how the schemes are delivered uh, is something that has to be uh, considered at this stage, uh, not after the regulations have been agreed. So if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to uh, split my presentation up into three sections. Uh, firstly, I'm briefly going to uh, run through the, the current structures for the control and audit um, of the CIP. Um, uh, th th that hopefully will be well known. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about some uh, generic risks uh, arising out of the current framework. Uh, and finally, um, I'm going to look at some of the specific risks uh, and issues that uh, come out of the uh, proposals for direct payments. So if we could move on. Um, I'll, I'll go through the next set of slides fairly quickly because uh, in a sense it's really setting the, the context. Um, 
of the, the three areas, um, if, we, if we start with the requirements of the paying agencies, um, member states, of course, have to accredit paying agencies. The EU will only finance expenditure uh, affected by an accredited <coughs> paying agency. Uh, and where there is more than one paying agency in a member state, um, uh, there is a coordinating body which, uh, if you like, acts as the, the link with the EU institutions and harmonises the application of the regulations in the member state. So if I could go on to the... <coughs> Sorry, we don't have the technology. We need one of those boxes. <laughs> right, moving on. Um, and of course, without going into the details, the paying agencies have to set up a system to control the expenditure. Um, that involves, uh, if, we, if we're looking at the direct payments, uh, typically we're looking at 100% uh, administrative checks and 5% on the spot uh, checks uh, selected on a mixture of, of risk uh, criteria and randomly selected uh, transactions. And of course, uh, mem the, the paying agencies have to operate uh, what's known as an integrated administration and control system, which is a set of databases uh, that cover all of the key elements. So the, the applications from the farmers, the land parcels, entitlements, customer details, and so on. And there are reporting obligations on the paying agencies. They have to draw up annual accounts. Um, they have to prepare a statement of assurance. Um, they have to summarize the results of all of the audits and checks done within the agency. And they have to supply all of that uh, to the uh, commission by the 1st of February. So for the financial year 2011, uh, all of those accounts and declarations have just been submitted. And to provide assurance on that, there is the certifying bodies uh, who carry out uh, an annual certification audit. Um, the certification body is designated by the member state. Uh, and if we look at the draft horizontal regulation, moving on to the next slide, uh, the requirement on the certification body will be to provide assurance on a number of criteria. This wording, incidentally, is subject to um, what comes out of the revised financial regulation. Um, but I think um, this gives a, a, a pretty good indication of what the certifying bodies will be doing in the future. It builds, of course, on what they already do. They have to provide an opinion on the accounts. They, uh, they will have to look at the paying agency's internal control system. They will have to provide an opinion on the legality and regularity of the underlying transactions. And this is a major new uh, development. Um, and also whether the agencies respect the principle of sound financial uh, management. Uh, and then the commission clears the accounts. There is a financial clearance by the 30th of April uh, based on the audit opinions provided by the certifying bodies. Um, that covers the completeness, accuracy, and veracity of the annual accounts. And then, uh, in addition to that, the Commission uh, organises its own conformity audit visits um, in the member states on the ground. And as a result of those audit inquiries, the Commission decides um, what expenditure to exclude by way of financial corrections. And those uh, financial corrections or disallowance can be significant. So um, moving on then in terms of some of the general um, conclusions that can be drawn from the current uh, system for control and, and audit. Well, as I think everyone will know, the um, error rate established by the uh, Court of Auditors in its annual uh, DAS audit, Declaration d'Assurance, uh, for the cap as a whole was 2.3%. Uh, of course, uh, that uh, disguises quite a lot of variety between uh, the different schemes. Uh, the error rate for Pillar 2, somewhat higher than on uh, Pillar 1. But I think, although um, 
the error rate on direct payments is currently fairly low. Um, I think we can't be complacent. I think the success in driving down the rate of error on pillar one, uh, particularly direct payments, um, has not been achieved easily. It's come at considerable cost to member states and paying agencies. And there is a genuine risk that um, the error rate could uh, rise. Obviously, there are a number of um, factors that, that drive the error rate, but certainly the complexity of the scheme rules is one. Uh, and as I will suggest, some of the elements of the um, cap reform proposals do raise uh, issues that uh, and risks of an increased error rate. Member states are naturally concerned about costs of controls. Um, now, obviously, um, that concern can't override the legitimate concern for sound financial management. Uh, but I think it is worth noting that um, most member states are having to implement uh, quite drastic reductions in public expenditure in the current economic uh, conditions. Uh, and that, of course, affects the paying agencies as well. And so uh, there is a pressing need for simplification um, to ensure that the costs are not greater than they need to be. And that message has been uh, discussed on many occasions. Uh, I'll just quote a couple. Um, at the Agriculture Council in March last year, uh, there was a paper which uh, was presented on behalf of 26 of the 27 member states, um, which set out a number of simplification principles. Uh, and uh, at the November uh, Council, um, a paper was tabled summarising the conclusions of the Conference of Paying Agency Directors. And again, there was a very clear message about the administrative burdens faced by the, the paying agencies. Now, it's interesting to see the Court of Auditor's opinion on the uh, 2010 annual report, uh, because I think this quotation that I've put up here encapsulates the challenge, how do you ensure the legality and regularity of payments at a sustainable and acceptable cost. Um, and as uh, the uh, conclusion points out, um, that there's a need for the regulations and the systems for control and assurance uh, to be fit for purpose. And I just want to look at three uh, areas where the paying agencies um, feel that there could be uh, improvements. Um, as I said earlier, paying agencies have to uh, apply administrative and on-the-spot checks. Um, the paying agencies uh, very much feel that uh, more could be done in terms of moving towards uh, a risk-based ap approach. Um, where appropriate, uh, it may be possible to um, reduce the, uh, the number of controls. Obviously, that has to be on the basis of firm evidence uh, about error rates and the, the quality of the, the data that the paying agencies have. But there may well be scope to, to look at that. Um, one of the issues that often comes up from beneficiaries is the penalties that are imposed. Uh, sometimes they do seem to be disproportionate to the uh, size and nature of the infringements that are found by their paying agencies. Uh, and of course, cross-compliance is, is an area that uh, has generated quite a lot of debate around uh, complexity. On the uh, audit and assurance front, um, there are a considerable number of different audits when paying agencies are set up or reorganized. Uh, generally, there has to be an accreditation audit. There's the annual certification audits. There are the new requirements uh, for the audit of legality and regularity. Um, there are other requirements, uh, quality assurance frameworks uh, and the like, um, all of which 
place a considerable um, burden on the uh, paying agencies and um, where at all possible um, the paying agencies feel that these should be integrated uh, and as we heard earlier there may also be scope for uh, higher tiers within the assurance structure to place reliance on the work done at the lower tiers. And a final uh, generic issue is around uh, disallowance, uh, where financial corrections are often linked on uh, or linked to flat rate percentages, uh, and uh, particularly where you have a large uh, amount of money being paid out under a scheme like the single payment scheme, that, that produces some some pretty big financial corrections. Uh, and so I think where both the Commission and the paying agencies are, are working together is to uh, try to see ways in which calculated financial corrections can be derived, uh, which uh, perhaps more accurately reflects the, the genuine risk to the fund. So I'll move now on to the final section of uh, my presentation, uh, which is uh, around some of the additional issues that are posed by the proposals for direct payments. Um, you'll no doubt be familiar with the structure uh, of the proposal announced in October last year. Um, and I think the only thing I want to say on this slide is that uh, there will be quite a lot of complexity involved in the different elements. Uh, effectively, you're going from one scheme to several schemes uh, with the basic payment, the greening payment, accounting for 30% of direct payments, uh, and the, the other aspects of the reform. Now, the, perhaps the, the first area that the PEG agencies look at is how much is this going to cost in the Commission's own impact assessment. Um, there was a, an estimate that uh, there could be a 15% increase in the costs. I think it remains to be seen um, whether that, is, uh, that fully takes account of all of the, the costs. But you have to compare that with um, the budget reductions that a lot of paying agencies are facing, often of the order of 20%, and I think that's pretty common across most member states. A second issue is around the transition process. Um, I think this is one of the areas that concerns paying agencies most, um, that uh, once the basic regulations are agreed, there then has to be the implementing regulations, it's only once you have agreed implementing regulations that the paying agencies have a clear understanding of what it is they have to implement and deliver. Uh, there is often a considerable lead time uh, in terms of changing all of the IT systems, changing the business procedures, uh, and actually delivering um, a reformed package uh, to farmers. And uh, I think most paying agencies say that uh, changes of, of this order of magnitude would probably take 18 to 24 months. So that does call into question whether a 2014 uh, implementation for the direct payments is going to be realistic, um, even with uh, best efforts. And finally, I want to just pick out um, some specific um, issues from the direct payments proposals. Uh, obviously, I can't uh, mention all of them, um, but I want to just mention four. The first one is greening. Um, of course, as has already been mentioned, there are the, the three elements to the uh, greening uh, proposal with crop diversification, ecological focus areas, and the permanent grassland requirement. Um, now, each of those poses, although they are sort of fairly generic kind of requirements, um, all of those poses delivery risks. Um, so uh, there's the risk of unintended 
consequences. Um, I've listed a few examples there. There's uh, mixed farms which might grow just one crop for feed or straw. Um, there are uh, livestock farmers who um, have uh, long grass lays which they may wish to plough and reseed. Um, there are farms which are subject to climatic restrictions and if you look at the detailed analysis, um, there are certain areas which come pretty close to the 70% uh, limit uh, in the crop diversification requirement, uh, which all, all of these means that farmers would have to um, change uh, their activities to comply with the, the rules. That causes issues for the paying agencies as well. Uh, and. Um, some, some of the issues uh, involve what, how do you define a crop? Um, it's, it's not clear at the moment exactly how, um, what will count as a crop and what will count as a different crop. Will spring wheat or winter wheat, will, will they be um, different? Certainly it's likely that the paying agencies within their land registers will have to set up a lot of new crop codes. There's the risk that farmers will be switching parcels to meet the requirements. All of that increases the volume of activity for the, for the paying agencies. And perhaps the question should be posed in terms of whether simpler alternatives uh, exist. A second area is the active farmer test, and I think this is an area that causes um, a lot of concern. The draft regulation uh, stipulates, amongst other things, that no direct payment shall be granted where the annual amount of direct payments is less than 5% of the total receipts obtained from non-agricultural activities. Now, the assumption, I think, is that it will be possible to obtain the, the necessary information from the tax authorities. Uh, I think certainly in the, the UK, and I, I suspect in other member states, uh, that is not as easy as it sounds, even if you can get databases to talk to each other, um, that uh, total receipts, um, of course you're only talking about non-agricultural activities, uh, you're talking about all receipts, whether capital or income, on a gross basis, whereas taxable business profits are calculated in a, in a very different way. They cover all activities. It may not be easy to split between agricultural and non-agricultural activities. It excludes capital items. It's done on a net basis. It's on a different basis of accounting. There are adjustments under tax law. So you're perhaps not comparing like with like. So that's going to be an issue. Uh, and uh, again, the paying agencies have suggested that there might be alternative ways to look at it, perhaps by making a, a link to land eligibility and active farming. In other words, uh, the activity on the farm rather than the income of the farmer. That would certainly be easier for paying agencies to check. Um, th there are other alternatives as well in terms of particular kinds of business. If the objective is to exclude particular kinds of businesses, that could be listed out as well. Um, but there is a risk that if a farmer, for example, sold some redundant buildings, that could, although they're a, a working farmer, that they could um, fail the active farmer test because of that uh, particular receipt. A third area is the uh, capping provision. Um, there's a risk uh, that um, farmers could try and split their business. That poses uh, issues for paying agencies. Uh, what is a genuine uh, division of a business because two partners decide to, uh, to go their own ways? Um, or is it a, an artificial split to meet the uh, capping requirement? That's going to be quite difficult in practice. And also the salary, salary mitigation provision um, raises a number of issues in terms of having to check uh, salary details. Uh, and again, what, what counts towards that? Um, so again, another example of additional complexity. And uh, finally, 
entitlements. The current SBS entitlements will expire on the 31st of December. Paying agencies will have to allocate new entitlements, and that uh, includes um, even those member states uh, or regions who have already moved to a system of flat rate payments. So again, another major task for paying agencies. So just to conclude uh, with a final slide, um, the proposals for direct payments raise a number of risks, certainly seen from a paying agency perspective. Um, I think the paying agencies are struggling to see where uh, the, the real simplification is in the proposals. Um, there's certainly a number of new demanding um, and potentially costly requirements, uh, both for paying agencies and for farmers. Um, the transition timetable uh, seems very um, demanding, not to say unrealistic. Uh, and the potential result um, of the complexity, as well as additional costs, could be an increase in the error rate. And that is something that will have to be monitored very carefully. So, Mr Chairman, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Michael. That, uh, you posed uh, quite a significant number of questions there that hopefully we can explore uh, once we get to the, the question and answer session. Uh, and can I thank you for sticking very closely to the, the time allocated. Uh, you were bang on time. Uh, the second speaker I have here on the panel with us this afternoon is Pierre Bascou. Uh, he is head of DG Agri Unit for Policy Analysis and Perspective. Uh, the unit is char in charge of producing the impact assessments for the CAP reform and therefore he should be able to clarify some of the questions that have been uh, raised here today at this uh, seminar. So, uh, Pierre, can I hand over to you, can I remind you 20 minutes, you'll get a chance to further explain during the question and answer session at the end. Thank you. Je vous remercie. Oui, effectivement, j'essaierai de présenter de façon assez brève, en fait, les... les... Well, I tried to give you a very brief overview. I'd like to just run through these things very quickly so that we have enough time for questions at the end. Many of the elements I want to pick up upon have already been raised during the first panel discussion, so I don't want to repeat those points here. So there are some measures here that I'd like to talk about in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, when talking about the newly reformed CAP. I'd like to thank um, the other speakers because it's true that the stress on efficiency is something we should never lose sight of. You can always do better. Now, for 20 years, the CAP has been evolving, developing. There have been major changes and we've managed to make it into a policy that's much more effective and efficient. I think that we can certainly say in, in general terms, and it's been reflected in the various evaluations of the CAP over the last 15 years, you can see that the CAP has come a very long way. So looking to the future then, it's quite clear that there's still some way to go, some progress to be made. So. In my presentation today, I'd like to pick up on those points. Now, the, just a general remark I would make at this point, and it ties in well with the three previous presenters. With the new CAP, we should be well aware of the fact that there are two requirements. There's uh, the two cons constraints, the budgetary constraint, which is a major constraint. There is a strict a limited budgetary framework but uh, on the other hand there's also the diversity in terms of the structures the level of comp competitiveness in the agricultural sphere across the various member states and regions so it's quite clear that diversity of situations is something that we need to take into account and offer a diversified package 
that will be well adapted to the needs and concerns and the challenges that are being faced in a given region. So moving on to reflect this efficiency target, we need to have clear objectives fixed in the CAP and these objectives of course reflect the major challenges in farming and agriculture for the future. This writing is a bit small, I do hope you can read it, but in any case you can hear me. There are three major challenges we identify for farming in the future and the CAP for the future. This is not a, a challenge that's unique to Europe, it's a worldwide challenge. The first one is the rising prices of agricultural goods, the rising costs of agriculture. Now these price increases are caused by general rise in prices in farming and farming techniques which puts pressure on the sector much more now than ever before. It's a major problem for farmers a huge challenge that needs to be overcome. On markets, we're seeing a very clear link between agricultural products and fuel prices. And we're seeing margins very much under pressure now. Margins, in fact, have been dwindling over the last 15 years. And now with the economic crisis, on top of everything else, there are additional pressures on the uh, cost of production. So major economic challenges. And I think that this has been alluded to. We need to think about this sector, which is where you've got average incomes well below normal average incomes elsewhere in society. So we're already looking at a very precarious, delicate situation that should be taken into account. Now, a second major challenge, that's climate change, climate challenges, which is going to bring about a lot of uncertainties for the future. Now, this is a challenge that certainly should uh, influence policy making in the field of agriculture when you're looking at environmental policy in terms of uh, adapting to climate change. Well, there again, farmers are very much involved in that they, since they also depend on environmental factors. Now there's a final problem, a final challenge, and that is the depletion of natural resources. It's a global problem and it's uh, certainly a problem here. We're seeing a problem of water quality, soil quality, air quality. So major efforts need to be made in order to ensure that we can have long-term competitiveness. And the final major challenge, which is reduced growth in productivity. So we're saying that growth slowing down now in recent years. We need to step up efforts in terms of research, knowledge, expertise, so that we can tackle the three challenges I've mentioned, the environmental challenges, the economic challenges, and so on. So what can we conclude then? How can we deal with these territorial economic and environmental challenges? Well, uh, as I said, many of these challenges are global challenges, not just European challenges. The economic side is not only dealt with in terms of matching demand and supply, but you also have to look at striking the right balance in terms of production across European territory. Markets more than ever before are going to dictate what's being produced, what's being grown where, and that should therefore have an effect on production. 
and it's going to have a knock-on effect on the environment as well as social conditions. Now, this is something we should recognise. We should recognise the fact that agriculture, farming, provides not only material goods, but also uh, goods of general interest. There's a very positive role to be played in terms of ensuring that we can have sustainability, sustainable farming, which is going to be a public good. We need for this policy to uh, really address this challenge. Now, there's another challenge of volatility, fluctuations, something that farmers are going to have to adjust to, and thinking about how that's going to affect the rest of the food chain. Now, the pricing needs to be real, effective, needs to be balanced. You don't want an imbalance uh, between the farming sector and the rest of the supply chain. We've got a historical problem where um, the farming sector is actually getting the smallest portion of the actual sale price. So we need the right instruments in place so that uh, farmers can manage these risks, price risks, income risks. Just two or three charts here to illustrate what I've just said in terms of the economic and environmental challenges. Here you can see how uh, agricultural goods have been developing in terms of the price fluctuations over the last few years. Green lines shows you the prices as they've fluctuated over 60 year period. So w you can see that there's a reversing of the downward trend that's been dominating for many decades. So the conclusion is that w farming is becoming more economically viable. But the red line here shows you the evolution of fuel prices, uh, other lines show you various other natural resources and the prices for those. So you can see that uh, any increase in terms of margins for the farming sector have been largely swallowed up by the rises in fuel prices. We're seeing um, costs of fertilizers increasing by 180 uh, percent, more than 200 percent increases for fuel costs. So that's, of course, putting pressure on margins. So just to illustrate to you the complexity of agricultural markets and the problems that farmers face when it comes to shifting towards a mar market-oriented scheme, well, here you can see how markets used to work in the past. Supply, demand, macroeconomic variables and their impact on farmers, exchange rates, and so on. And now we've got a, the system as it works today. The market has become much more complicated. There's, of course, climate change, adding in additional variables, the impact of policies such as the CAP, internal policies, external policies that don't always match up. We also have the interaction between the farming sector and the energy sector and the larger share of farming costs that uh, energy now takes up. And then finally you've got the uh, larger proportion of agriculture in financial markets, the significance on financial markets there. So that's also affecting uh, 
uh, the farming sector. Now on this slide, we've heard uh, criticism against the vague or unclear uh, targets and objectives in the old policy and the new policy as it's been put forward. But it's very important that we recognize what the objectives were. They were described in Article 39 of the treaty. But now, for the first time since the communication of 2010, and this was uh, widely supported by the European institutions, there are three major operational objectives. First of all, a viable food production system. Second objective and third objective were sustainable management of natural resources and finally balancing out territorial aspects and regional aspects within the rural sphere. So we do have far better definitions of the operational object objectives. They're set out very clearly so that we have now the tools in hand to fight the major, uh, to, to meet the major challenges that are coming our way. Now the reform objectives, as they've been called. We're talking with the CAP, uh, the policy that's got a heritage, it's got a very long history, perhaps even a historical burden, we might say. So there is, of course, a need for reform. The first objective is to enhance competitiveness and secondly, to improve sustainability, and finally, to improve effectiveness, the effectiveness of the policy itself. When it comes to uh, the farmers themselves and what they get out of it, but also the taxpayer. So to elaborate on that, which measures would we need in order to implement, uh, to achieve these targets. Well, having listened to Mr. Cretin's presentation, having listened very carefully to the debate, I think I can reassure Mr. Cretin and uh, say that we've taken on board a, a large part of what uh, was recommended by the Court of Auditors. One new element in the reform proposal is that the two pillars, both pillars, are going to contribute to b achieving the three major objectives that I've outlined. So all three, all two pillars will be trying to achieve the three objectives. So even though they will be trying to aim to achieve the same objectives. We will have different mechanisms in place to achieve them using different methods. So one is going, aspect is going to be the compulsory aspect, the compulsory side, com complemented then by the optional extras. So first of all, the objective of competitiveness. Well, there we have simplified things quite a bit when it comes to managing markets. We have risk management instruments, for example, that are being introduced. The French Court of Auditors uh, recommended that we invest more efforts in uh, risk management tools. We've also simplified exceptional measures. Now, on improving sustainability, the second objective there, we've brought in the concept of greening from the first pillar. But let me stay very, state very clearly that greening is just one of the uh, methods that we've adopted for achieving sustainability. We're going to use uh, 
uh, cross compliance as a principle and as a way of reducing the administrative burden. We want to ensure that only those aspects, only those requirements which are actually relevant to a farmer or a, a farm in question are going to be required. So we have the right criteria being applied to the right farm. Now, this is why we have rules that are worded in a way that apply for the whole of Europe. But of course, all of these measures are going to be kept simple, effective. They're going to apply across the European territory and they'll be easy to check up on. Now finally, on all the specifics, the specific needs for regions, well there we've reinforced environmental and climate measures in the second pillar. Now finally, greater effectiveness, all the measures that have been adopted to improve efficiency. Targeting, for example, uh, young farmers, green payments, also assessing need in terms of income support. We've talked about whether there's a real link between the payments that are given and uh, the actual need for for subsidy. So that's something that's going to be assessed very carefully. Member states that wish to will be allowed to adjust payments according to the actual needs of a given region in their country. So if I may just very briefly, we've talked about simplification and this is now we what we haven't talked about the simplification of the second pillar and making it more uh, coherent with other community policies. So there we have the, the common strategies. And my very final point, Chairman, on the follow-up and checks for the CAP. Now these checks only currently exist for the second pillar, so we're going to have a, an instrument in place for evaluation checks on the performance of the CAP for the entire policy. Now this constant evaluation is going to allow us to keep track of how well the policy is performing uh, with regard to the three major objectives. Now the proposals for the revised CAP, which is being debated at the moment, is going to be a policy that's going to really respond to the challenges. It's going to be flexible enough to adapt to specificities of given regions and countries. We can't have a framework that's too rigid, that's not going to take into account the specific needs of a given region or a given in, uh, sector. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Pierre. That's uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, we're joined by uh, a number of MEPs who are welcome to this particular session. Uh, and I now would like to open the floor to questions because the, certainly in the first presentation there, there was some pretty uh, difficult questions that uh, appeared uh, before us, uh, some of which we were, were aware of. Uh, but I'd like to give up MEPs, first of all, to have an opportunity to ask, ask questions. So uh, does anyone want to, to pose a question? No? If not, anyone else from the floor want to? Yeah. Yes. Jim. Yeah, uh, I've listened with tremendous interest. And I'm sorry I, I missed the first part, but I have to admit that the, you Liberals are running two seminars today, so I had to go to the Fisheries one as well. Uh, so uh, can I make my apologies for that, uh, missing the first? Uh, and I, I have listened to two 
tremendous presentations here, totally running in diverse uh, areas. The first man has told us very clearly that uh, there's going to be at least 15% of implementation costs, plus he may be 20% worse off. I listened to uh, the, the last presenter, and I listened with great interest. And you know, the one thing that I hear everywhere I go, for it doesn't matter where I go in Europe, there's only one thing on everybody's lips, simplification. And all I can see coming forward at me is more and more bureaucracy and red tape. And as Maria McGuinness is here, she calls it green tape. So what is the truth? What can we take back and what can we expect our farmers uh, uh, to have? And, uh, you know, it, it's easy to talk about all these things. But, you know, we talked about food security. And I have to say, this is the first time I've heard food security mentioned here in almost two years. And, you know, then we get 7% cutback. Like, what? Where are we going? And I'm, I, I, what really scares me is, is the first speaker saying, that he cannot see this being implemented before 2015. And you know, I'm beginning to think he's right. Because if we get the implementation of this wrong, then this is going to be a disaster for the farmers of Europe, all over Europe. Thank you for that, uh, Jim. I'm sure you've heard food security mentioned at the Agriculture Committee, though. <laughs> uh, Merid, would you like to move raise one? Thank you, um, and thank you to the organisers. Um, I suppose there are two industries here, it seems to me. One is uh, not present because they're in the fields, they're the farmers. And the second is the industry of cross-compliance, of controls, of member states, systems, which we heard in great detail. Um, one is shrinking and the other appears to be growing. And, and I don't say that with any degree of delight or even cynicism, because I think we all share the same objective, which is a sustainable agriculture under the, the common agriculture policy. Um, and I accept in good faith what the commissioner is saying, but I do think that those of us with greater contact on the ground are really concerned about the greening component and its negative impact on the farm sector, that it is not about sustainability, but that it will grow the other industry that I have described. So um, I would ask the Commission about the possibility of broadening this uh, beyond the, the limit of three particular measures, um, which are not applicable for all member states or indeed in all farming circumstances. Um, and I think we need to see an openness to do that. And we need to see a willingness at Commission level to explain, and perhaps this is my direct question, I have read the text, sometimes I've overread it perhaps, but I am not clear about the 7% of eligible land. Uh, I need clarity on that, and I think it would be helpful to explain um, what exactly the Commission are talking about in, in that, because others use the term set aside and the impact of that on some farms. And it goes to the issue of land sparing or land sharing, which has never been really discussed, I think, properly in terms of these proposals. So I'll close my remarks at that, but just welcome um, the, the opportunity to, to raise these issues. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Could I maybe ask you, Pierre, to, to address the first... Oh, oh sorry. Uh, welcome, Louis. Okay. Merci, Georges. Thank you, George. Unfortunately, I too was unable to attend the first panel, but I would like to commend you on this very important initiative that you have taken. It is crucial that we organise our discussions early on now while the decisions are being prepared. Your report and the DES report both uh, garnered uh, significant majority backing and now the time is ripe to get the right tangible instruments to achieve the goals set. Now we want to try and achieve the objectives uh, we want to reconcile different objectives. Uh, the environmentalists find the proposals uh, too uh, 
timid that they don't go far enough. For those involved in production, they find the measures constraining, too restrictive, and we need to strike the right balance. The Commission proposal sets out a general architecture, but I think that there is potential for correction. Just to give you an example, biodiversity is very important, but we need to explain to citizens and justify why public funds are being spent in this way. Can we force a small farm of about seven hectares to uh, remove 7% in the interests of biodiversity? I do wonder whether there would be significant benefits for the environmental biodiversity should we not limit application of this measure to larger farms where there would be fewer difficulties? I think that we need to get the right solutions, get the right compromises in place so that we can indeed ultimately achieve those objectives set. Any suggestions are indeed warmly welcome so that we can define a framework that is understandable for citizens and stable for farmers. We also want simple implementation as our colleague has just quite rightly pointed out. Those are my comments. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation for uh, the debate that has been organised and the event organised here today. Uh, thank, <coughs> thank you, Louis. Could, could I maybe ask Pierre just to address some of the issues that were raised in Michael Cooper's uh, presentation, which was around the bureaucracy question that, that Jim rightly raised. Uh, now Michael talked about the worry that it would take 18 to 24 months to put this in place. He talked about at least 15% extra cost to member states for implementing the new CAP. He raised the issue of active farmers uh, and how on earth you def define uh, this income uh, component. And he talked about capping and again he raised the concerns about uh, how you define the salary component. Uh, that seems to contradict the simplification message that you were trying to go over. Could you maybe just respond to him and, and let us know whether you think he's wrong or, or, uh, has he, has, uh, or is, have you an answer to that? Wrong. Um, on the 15%, no, because we provided that figure, so I can hardly claim that it is a mistake. It has been taken from our impact uh, study. Will this lead to simplification or more complex CAP? Well, I don't think that we can put things so simply. We are facing major challenges, challenges that are new for some people. So given those challenges, we need to put in place instruments that are as effective and as straightforward as possible. It is clear that if you look at the starting point, if we want more targeting, we need more follow-up, monitoring inspections. Take the example of active farmers. What are we looking to achieve here? We want to give the CAP more legitimacy, effectiveness, and at the same time ensure that payments reach the beneficiaries and want to ensure that payments reach uh, beneficiaries that uh, have more than a marginal impact on farming. It is difficult to establish criteria to ensure balanced uh, approach across the European Union. What we are suggesting is that we have the option of excluding some beneficiaries, beneficiaries deemed uh, marginal in terms of uh, farm policy. We're talking here about airports, uh, major companies, railways. We also want the option of excluding uh, beneficiaries in certain regions, beneficiaries who aren't doing anything with their land but still receive subsidies. 
That's why we came up with the 5% uh, definition compared to the overall income. We feel that this is the most straightforward approach, the most effective solution. Now, will this lead to more work for paying agencies to track down the information? Well, clearly there is additional work, but we feel that if you look at the objectives and the need to achieve greater efficiency effectiveness, the Commission does believe that this is the best way to strike the right balance between complexity and efficiency. Will I move on to the whole issue of sustainability now? One other issue. Do you agree with Michael's view that 18 to 24 months to implement it? Because that, that is a huge issue. No. En matière de, de... On the time frame for implementation, we hope that if the institutions involved reach agreement uh, over the next 15 to 18 months, we will then be in a position to put in place a farm policy that can be managed and vetted as of the beginning of 2014. It is true that uh, we're talking about a very tight time frame. There's no denying that. But we hope that the new policy will be in place with implementing regulations. We hope that it will all be in place by the start of 2014, in other words, in two years' time. Uh, thank you for that. If you could deal with this, the 7% ecological yeah. set-aside question and the a question that Mirid put about a wider range of mm. measures. Are the three measures the right ones or, yeah. or have you considered others? Because that's part of the debate mm. that's going on at the moment. Il est clair matière... We could bring up the slide, but never mind. Sustainability. It is clear that we really need to improve the sustainability of the agricultural sector. We are seeing natural resources deteriorate to 25% of uh, soil erosion around the European Union and other problems. A very serious deterioration in natural resources and we must address this problem. This more than likely will have a knock-on effect in 10 to 15 years but we believe that we need to address the problem right now, without delay. This will have an impact on farm products, but we also need to look at management of natural resources. I talked about uh, the uh, lower growth rates for productivity and the various problems. But this is a global problem, too. Now, on the need to improve sustainability, we decided to bolster cross-compliance, streamline the measures, focus on environment and climate change measures, have more effective cross-compliance measures. We're also going to strengthen the second pillar. We want to use the first pillar too, so that all farmers receiving direct payments can make a contribution to ensuring sound, sustainable management of natural resources. The prerequisite would be to ensure requirements uh, under the first pillar. It's very difficult to fine-tune, have specific measures tailored to local conditions. The measures proposed are measures that we believe could be applied in general. We talked about uh, diversification, crop rotation, also maintaining uh, pasture land for the livestock farming sector. We also talked about uh, ecological land and the biodiversity. Those are three different areas uh, that uh, can cover the whole of the European Union territory, could bring genuine environmental benefits and they can be managed and uh, vetted with the current uh, IACS tools. Will these measures address all problems? Well, clearly in some regions we will need to allow some flexibility. That is something currently being discussed with the European institutions. Will those three measures be enough? Should we have four more, a list? 
will have to uh, strive to get the right balance between uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and ease of management and checks on the one hand, and of course the environmental impact that these measures have. But in all our discussions, we need to bear in mind that we don't just have greening under the first pillar to improve sustainability, we also have uh, agro-environmental and environment and climate change measures under the second pillar. Those could be more ad hoc specific uh, measures tailored to local circumstances. And perhaps just to wind up on this point, we carried out an impact assessment and we did uh, weigh up a fourth measure looking at uh, soil cover in winter. We did not uh, include this measure in the Commission proposal because of the administrative burden involved in management and inspections. It would ha bring significant environmental benefits, but we felt that the measure was too cumbersome. And on the eco eco ecological focus area measure, now, our aim here is to improve biodiversity. We have a definition that allows farmers to ascertain on their eligible land and farms issues such as uh, landscape features. Uh, they can assess what is good for bud diversity. The aim is not to bring about set aside, the aim is to maintain biodiversity at the end of the day and to improve water and soil quality in those regions. What we want to do is reward and enhance what is good so that we can improve biodiversity. We believe that the impact on production should be quite limited according to our calculation, certainly on most farms, the vast majority of farms. Uh, thank you for that. Just on the bureaucracy question, can I maybe bring in Michael Cooper? Uh, you talked in your your uh, in, in your uh, slides. You you talked about legally legality and regularity becoming compulsory, being a big issue. Could you maybe explain a little further? Also, you talked about a risk-based approach rather than uh, spot checks and compulsory checks on farmers, because that is a huge issue. The number of checks that are that are that are allowed, and then the need to rely on certification bodies you uh, at, at a member state level. How does that square with Michel Cretons? view that you can't actually trust at the moment the uh, member state certification body's results and therefore they have to be double checked again. Yes, yeah, so st starting off with the question of uh, the audit of legality and regularity, uh, that will be a new requirement. Uh, essentially the certification audit at the moment uh, is a financial audit of the um, completeness and accuracy of the accounts. Um, the scope of the certification audit has gradually been extended over um, the last few years, including an assessment of the quality of the control statistics. But what it doesn't at the moment address um, is the uh, legality and regularity of the underlying transactions in the way that the Court of Auditors uh, carries out its DAS audit. Um, the intention is that that will become mandatory post-2013. Uh, uh, at the moment, there is a voluntary uh, regime. Um, member states can undertake a, uh, a voluntary audit of the um, legality and regularity of transactions. Uh, only a few member states at the moment are following that. Um, the particular concern that paying agencies have is the way in which that will be implemented because the voluntary guideline that currently exists envisages, envisages a, a very large number of reperformance of inspections, um, which um, would place considerable burdens both on the paying agencies, uh, the certifying bodies, and the beneficiaries being reinspected. Uh, and uh, we feel, and to be fair, we're having a, a very positive uh, conversation with the Commission in terms of whether there are better ways in which we can move that process uh, onto a, uh, a more risk-based approach. Uh, so I think uh, the discussions are still continuing, but I think we, we would say uh, the, the, uh, the inspection, the on-the-spot check is a very important control, 
but it is a, a control that can be tested just in the same way as any other control. And so we would we would see this new requirement really as being a an extension of the existing certification audit rather than a completely new regime. And we would want to see the, the two integrated. And I think also we would hope that there can be some carrots as well as sticks. So in other words, if you do the, the additional audit work, uh, you get a low error rate in terms of the, the uh, accuracy of the underlying transactions. There could be benefits in terms of reduced controls, uh, hopefully reduced financial corrections, uh, and possibly uh, less requirement for the Commission to undertake their conformity audits because they would be able to um, to place the reliance on the uh, certifying bodies. O on the question of control statistics, um, yes, I think there has been an issue in terms of the, the quality of those control statistics. Uh, that's an area where certainly the paying agencies are seeking to improve the quality. The certifying body is required to give an audit opinion on that, uh, and in fact, um, in the last round, there's been an additional requirement to assess the quality of the IT systems that produce the control uh, statistics. So hopefully, uh, there will be, in, in the future, there will be uh, greater reliance. But also, of course, the certifying bodies um, have to look at the overall uh, position. It's not just the, the level of pharma irregularity as disclosed by the uh, control statistics. Uh, it's also the quality of the systems that uh, the paying agencies have. Uh, and so the uh, certifying bodies have to look at that. Uh, and uh, there are new requirements that have been brought in, particularly around the quality of the land register. So there are other sources of evidence. Thank you for that, Michael. I've got time for a couple more questions. A lady there uh, and a gentleman back. Can you tell us who you are? Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Therese Robbins. I work for BirdLife. Uh, thank you very much for organizing. It was a very interesting debate overall on all the different uh, panels. Um, uh, first of all, maybe uh, as we saw that certain people couldn't be here, I don't know whether uh, you have already invited the Court of Auditors to come to a hearing in the uh, Agricultural Committee to, uh, to present their uh, proposals on uh, uh, their uh, evaluation of the proposals. That would be certainly something that we would also be very interested in hearing. Uh, second of all, um, it's a, a question to uh, both panelists currently. It was very interesting to see that on Mr. Cooper's slides, uh, I think his last slide said, delivering direct payments. Now, that is, of course, his job is delivering direct payments, while the job of Mr. Bascu is delivering for all the European challenges and all the European objectives that we have. So the question is whether all the European challenges and objectives that we have will be able to be done in coherence with the exact correct delivering of the direct payments. And so there the question uh, comes, have you actually evaluated all the different proposals that are currently on the table? Because obviously in the impact assessment, we were still looking between the three options of the commission. But now that we are on that second option with the greening component, are you also looking into the different administrative burdens of different systems currently uh, discussed, like a package of agronomic measure, measures as proposed by the Commission versus a menu option, a menu at member state level, a menu at farmers level. Have you also looked at those different administrative burdens and potential uh, administrative uh, costs? Because that would be something that also would be uh, very interesting for us. Thank you. Thank you for that. The answer is yes to the first question, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Could I, a gentleman at the back, can just name and Thank you, Chairman Lee Kamp from the German Farmers Association. Mr. Bascu, thank you very much for your presentation. You uh, mentioned the dynamics of the farm policy over the last 20 years and described it very accurately. You talked about development since the McSharry reforms and the fact that the CAP has been in a constant process of reform. We have seen a clear market uh, orientation. That is something that we welcome. But clearly, 
environmental standards have become part and parcel of farm policy, especially in the second pillar. I'm not sure that this dimension has been sufficiently covered in the Commission proposal. You talked about the challenges as regards markets. Will we farmers increasingly have to grapple with global markets? You talked about market changes. Market prices are rising, but so are costs and productivity is dwindling. Your conclusion was that we needed to bolster the competitiveness of European farmers. The Commission target is quite right on that front. But if you look at the measures, the tools that you propose, then please, you have to explain to us where on earth you feel that these measures will help to bolster the competitiveness of farmers. Allow me to pick up on the greening component. Mr. Cooper and other speakers have mentioned the problems, and uh, there are other economic assessments that uh, talk about the very rigid approach to greening within the Commission and the fact that this can be destructive. It cannot work. It, is not, uh, it does not make environmental sense. So please, can you briefly explain to us how the Commission proposal will genuinely help to bolster the competitiveness of European farmers? I think that the opposite is true. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two qu final questions to Pierre, if you could address the, the first question from the BirdLife uh, representative, because I think we would like to know where you've done impact assessments on various other uh, delivery systems on the greening. Uh, and then secondly, the competitiveness issue raised by my colleague from Germany. OK, très rapidement. OK, very quickly. My answer to the first question on our analysis of the various options for greening. We conducted extensive work, looked at the figures, uh, assessed the costs attached to the three measures presented, and the winter soil cover measure. We did not carry out as in-depth an analysis of the, of the alternatives, but we did look at uh, administrative costs. We believe that there will be an increase in administrative costs uh, under the other options, because if you have three measures that are applied across the board, they can be inspected using current tools and instruments. If you were to give farmers a menu option with various alternatives and options designed to uh, look at IX and information collection systems. If you were to give all those options, you would see a significant rise in administrative costs. We wanted simple measures that could be applied across the board, across the European Union, so that uh, we could uh, allow uh, the option, if there are additional requirements when it comes to managing natural resources, we could allow the option of more targeted measures under the second pillar. There we would have specific support based on the additional production costs and lost income as a result of the measures. There are alternative proposals. We did look at them, but we don't have an in-depth analysis or impact assessment for those alternatives. But I don't see how those alternatives would uh, trigger lower costs than what we have selected. Now moving on to the second question on competitiveness. You talk about economic competitiveness. There are a number of proposals as regards research, innovation, transfer of knowledge, market instruments, risk management tools, a whole series of instruments and measures that are 
put in place to promote the competitiveness of the farm sector. We also have a series of measures in under the second pillar, structural adjustment measures to help farmers to be more competitive. During my presentation, I pointed out that economic competitiveness in the long term can only be viewed in connection with environmental competitiveness. We need to look at these issues because we have a problem as regards deterioration in natural uh, resources. And I don't think we'd be doing farmers any favours if we ignored natural resources for 10 years and then in 10 years time found ourselves face to face with serious problems that would trigger far higher costs for farmers compared to the expenses that they would have to deal with as regards greening now. We're talking about 40 to 45 euro per hectare. That's quite a low cost at the moment, particularly if you compare it to the whole issue of long-term competitiveness. Could I uh, just conclude the meeting by asking my colleague Jan Mulder uh, if he could uh, just bring the meeting to a close and thank our speakers. Thank you very much, George. I can only say that I have spent a very interesting afternoon and uh, although I had already some certain ideas about the proposals of the Commission, some of them have hardened even more and some of them have been put in doubt. I think as a Parliament and uh, the public can control it, we have to make sure that the budget is well spent and there must be a good justification for that. Now, if I listen to Mr. Crete, the example that he gave, I think we should avoid it at all cost in the future. I also uh, listened to Professor Novici, and one of the key things uh, that he said, the greening standards lack performance indicators. And I think that's the essential thing of the agricultural budget. Why do we support agriculture? First of all, for a stability in income. And secondly, a payment for services rendered to society. And they are ma mainly in the environmental field. But if you pay them for it, you must be make sure where we pay for. And that, in my view, is not at all clear at the moment. The court will be give, uh, giving an opinion on the proposals of the Commission. As usual, in the Budget Control Committee, they will be very much welcomed. I understand that your work is ready in about March. And I think uh, they are scheduled in the Budget Control Committee for the 24th and the 25th of April. The second part of this afternoon were for me quite revealing because there were two conflicting opinions from the Commission and from the people in the field who have to implement it. And uh, now, first of all, the extra administrative cost uh, doesn't make me very much optimistic, but also the time of implementation. Uh, the Commission representative said he is optimistic that it can be finished in the beginning of 2014. I hope we have an agreement on the budget by then. But uh, according to the, the people in the field, it will take another two years. Now, that means, of course, a risk of errors if there is a two years transition period. I think that the, the, I'm not sure if the Court of Auditors will be delighted, but we will see some interesting report about that uh, period, I think, as well. Uh, yeah, the thing is that agriculture, in my view, needs to be supported. If you look at the figures that Mr. Uh, uh, Bascou uh, presented, that we have seen, I have noted that, that we have seen a 61% increase in agricultural prices but a 180% increase in fertilizer and a 244% increase in energy. That is quite revealing. I think I also noted that if you look at the agricultural budget for the last number of years, the European Union has in fact decreased the budget in comparison to what we had for 15 countries. And now with 27 countries, I have not seen any reciprocal uh, movement in the other trading blocks of the world. I think we should keep that in mind as well. This afternoon, uh, for me, has given me plenty of uh, room and for further thought. I hope that you will all do, all do that, but we should not think too long. We have to try to, as much as possible to get an agreement this year because time is running out. Thank you very much for everybody that spoke this afternoon, everybody that listened, and I wish you a very good evening.
Thank you very much.